Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Justice Easy Show where if you have a talent or if you have a very hot event that you want the world to know about, it, getting exposure is just as easy as being a guest on the show. And we're very fortunate today. Our first guest is Professor Angel Halo Lopez and his wife, Mrs. Lopez. How are you doing? Thank you for being on the show. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great. So, Angel <coughs> Lopez, you, you're a mixed martial artist and you specialize in jujitsu? Yes, I do. I specialize in uh, Brazilian jujitsu. Um, that's what I do. Um, I have a local school here called Halo Jiu-Jitsu Training Center. Um, I coach students anywhere from the ages of four up to 104. There's no ages awesome. um, in Jiu-Jitsu. I say you can do it as long as you want. So right on. a lot of people. Now, is there a difference between Jiu-Jitsu <clears throat> and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Well, it does stem from uh, Japan, of course, which is Jiu-Jitsu. And uh, it starts standing. And then... Um, uh, we got Carlos Gracie Sr. that used to train over there with Mitsu Maeda. So he brought the art back to Brazil and transferred it to the ground. And okay. then it became a ground sport as well. Yeah. Nice. Now, I've taught 10 students. I used to be a, a school teacher. I've taught 10 students named Angel. And about nine of them had bad conduct all the time. Now, <laughs> <laughs> so how were, how were you in school? Um, actually, I was pretty good as a kid. I mean, um, they wanted to move me up grades when I was a young man, when I was in, what, fourth grade. Nice. And my mom said that I was too short, so she didn't want me to feel like, um, how can I say, like, intimidated by right. the taller kids so I guess she didn't move me up a grade so Just I guess I was doing height. yeah because of my height so I'm like wow. I'm that short guy that had kind of like skills I guess you know right. mentally <laughs> cognitively you were there but just with your height yeah she was too smart for his own good <clears throat> too smart that's awesome so that's a perfect segue into my next question which is I want to find out how it was that you got into jiu-jitsu okay I got into jiu-jitsu um, when we originally um, had a gym here in Fresno called Fresno Kickboxing Academy me and one of my partners, a gay Martin Gray guy. So, you know, he uh, gave me the idea to Angel. You want to open up the best gym in town or a martial arts facility? I'm all, let's do it. So, you know, we were wrestlers from our past and opened up an MMA camp. And uh, then uh, our professor Speedy came in and um, he changed everything. You know, when he came in the door, our, uh, we started a jiu-jitsu program, and then I started up with him training and fell in love with it because I'm an ex-wrestler, so it's a ground sport, mm -hmm. and I wanted to further, you know, my uh, skills on the ground, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu was the way to go, so that's how. Right on. You mentioned that it's a ground sport, and I, get a, I had a chance to see a couple of your videos recently, <clears throat> and so I know it's not karate, it's not judo, so what, ex what does jiu-jitsu mean? And like, describe well, it a little Brazilian jiu-jitsu is a complete art except for punches. You can't punch in it, but you can wrestle. There's okay. throws, you know, like Greco-Roman wrestling, freestyle, you know, collegiate wrestling, submission wrestling, catch wrestling. So it's a complete art. You know, once you hit the ground, you gotta know what to do, but you gotta also know takedowns, which the judo throws come in effect and your wrestling takedowns, stuff like that. All right, so you mentioned that you have a gym. Right. And I believe there's some promotions recently. You want to talk about Absolutely. Promotions? Today was a very huge day for a lot of our students. We promoted uh, six brand new black belts at Halo, along with some other blue belts and purple belts and brown belts. So to see them meet their milestone was a huge accompli accomplishment for them and me as a professor to be able to validate them. They've been doing jiu-jitsu over for anywhere from nine to 18 years. So definitely earned. Wow. Hard to get a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, not given has to be earned nice nice and i know i don't know a lot about <coughs> martial arts but i do know that in order to be a black belt you have to be like in the one to like three percentile exactly um you know the stats are ten thousand people sign up for brazilian jiu-jitsu and only one gets a black belt okay yeah so hey what about competitions anything going on that we need to know about yes january 11th i'll be competing in fight to win pro um it's the top uh, professional jiu-jitsu promotion in america and uh, I'll be fighting on that card in San Jose. Oh, I'm sorry, Sacramento. Sacramento, Sacramento January 11th. Okay. Yes, so looking you guys forward. heard that, January the 11th. And I happen to know that it is at the Sacramento Grand Hyatt Hotel. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? Yeah, January the 11th. Absolutely. Sounds like a great way to spend an afternoon, a great evening. Absolutely. Um, but before you, you go, I want to ask you, um, are you doing anything else, like anything abroad? Well, you know, after that, um, actually, uh, 
we're going to head to Europe right after that, after the Fight to Win Pro. We're going to go to Europe January 16th. I'm going to be competing in the Europe Europeans, the IBJJF, International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation. Wow. So we'll be competing in that big tournament out there. It's huge, actually. It's amazing. The crowd is wild, and I just can't wait to get out there and test my skills and be a better me. Wow. Angel, what's your record? What's your record? I don't have a record. Um, I How know. How many wins? Has, has anybody choked you out? Like Yes, you? I've been tapped out, of course. I mean, to make it to black belt, you're going to have a lot of trial and error, you know, along your career. I compete at the highest level, mm -hmm. you know, in the toughest leagues. And, you know, so you're going to get caught in submissions. It's part of it. Um, it's part of growing. You never lose. You always learn. So of course I've been I choked. Love I've, that philosophy. I've been choked never out. Never lose, you're always learning. Never lose, we're always learning. And yes, I've wow, been choked out. Great. Yes, I've been tapped. Yes, I've been arm barred. Yes, I've been foot locked. It's okay. You know, I'm still a four time master world champion, so it really doesn't matter. Wow. And the guy that you're going to be um, vetted against on January the 11th, do we have any idea what his record is? Has he been in it? I don't know. For his, the same amount of time? I, like, what's the. I don't know his record, but I know he's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, so I got to be ready for a great fight, and I'm excited about it. I'm excited too. How much are your tickets? Do we know that? Or do we have to go um, The tickets, you could go online, you know, to check uh, the website. I believe the tickets for general admission is $50, anywhere from, and for uh, VIP seats are anywhere from like $60. To okay. 70 and you could get right. vip tables as well get all your friends come out to the fight to win pro okay. it's an amazing uh, show it's so fun and energetic and i do have another question about that so is it kind of like comedy where if you go to see one performer you wind up seeing two or three fights or whatever Abs up to it? absolutely we um there's going to be 35 submission fights that night wow yeah so whole, so. Entertain whole night of fight yes so night. yes and so we nights. we had the fight to win pro here in fresno which was the last show of 2018. so there was over um 38 submission fights that night i believe Wow. Yeah, I and I was the main that. event that night, and we made history. You know, Team Halo was the biggest team in the history of Fight to Win Pro. Um, we got top crowd in California, top five in the country. Mm -hmm. And I was thankful that uh, the promoter, Seth Daniels, brought the show to us, and Team No Sleep put it all together. So we are just lucky to have them, you know, come and, you nice know, job. take a chance with Fresno. And, you know, we're having a great time, and um, Jiu-Jitsu is here to stay in Fresno, and it's mainstream. So. I want to ask Mrs. Lopez. Wait, real quick. Uh -huh. For some reason, if you can't make the Sacramento show, he'll be fighting again in February in Denver. February in Denver. So just yes. putting that out there. Either, but yeah, yeah but. maybe get some skiing in, you know, whatever. <laughs> Snowboarding. Hey, Ms. Lopez, what, yes. what's Angel like at home? Is he like a kind of hands-on kind um, of guy? Like, I've always referred to him as the Energizer Bunny. He keeps uh -huh. going and going and going, and he never gets tired. He's just full of energy. A lot of positive energy. <laughs> yes. I happen to work out at the same gym where Angel works out, or one of the gyms where he works out, and everybody knows. He's one of those mm -hmm. people, like, he's always shaking hands. He knows everybody. He has a lot of positive energy. Uh -huh. All right, guys, you heard that Angel Halo Lopez is fighting on January the 11th, and again in February in Denver. If you want an action-packed night, you'll make sure you go to his fight. We're going to go to a commercial break and then come right back. Okay, welcome back. I want to talk to you about education today. In the United States public schools, academic success is measured by the color, the class, and the socioeconomic levels of the students. So in other words, for the statewide assessment results, you might see something that says this percentage of African American students perform proficient, this percentage of Latino students were proficient, this, you know, and so on and so forth. Now, according to the National Center for Educational Statistics, students of color tend to underperform on these statewide assessments. And why this is really important is that these are the same assessment results that colleges sometimes consider when they're deciding who is going to be admitted into college and who isn't. So the question is, what is the best way to ensure that students of color get what they need in order to be successful on these tests and in life? And so joining us today is the one and only Dr. Ken Magdaleno. Thank you so much for being a guest today. <laughs> Thank you Dr. for having Magdaleno. me. Thank you. So what are your thoughts on the achievement gap and why educators are using, in my mind, what's considered like a colorblind approach to uh, educating students? Well, I think that there's uh, quite often we spend a lot of time on the achievement gap itself, when in my opinion, there are really three types of gaps. 
Okay. And, and those include something that I've written about with another professor, which is the acknowledgement gap. Mm -hmm. And then there's the opportunity gap. Then there's the achievement gap. And I don't believe you can really positively affect the achievement gap until you address the other gaps. All right. Now the, <clears throat> yeah, the acknowledgement gap, and, and it's a term that I coined some time ago, and that is that the, the failure of educational leaders to acknowledge the impact that issues of race, culture, equity, gender equity, mm -hmm. uh, socioeconomics have on the students that are coming to them. There's a failure for the general dominant group of leaders mm -hmm. to really acknowledge that those make a difference in the curriculum and how students learn. So that's the that's acknowledgement totally. gap. Da further down is the opportunity gap. Mm -hmm. And that is, if you, if, you, if you really take a look at the aspect of, of tracking, for instance, who has the opportunity to take the courses that will get you into college? So define tracking for, for the viewers. <clears throat> well, tracking, tracking generally is that if you, for instance, I, I have been blessed. I've been able to serve from preschool to doctoral programs. Mm -hmm. I have served at every level. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the lines, generally very early, students are seen as either a student that, was, that will be succeeding or mm -hmm. someone that will not be succeeding. They often use third grade as that literacy level. Mm -hmm. Well, many of our students, most of our students of color and most of our students of color who come from poverty are already tracked before they even begin school because mm -hmm. of a gap in their um, vocabulary. Sure. And, the, and, and they, so when they start, right away they're put oranges with oranges, apples with apples, and it remains that way. Right, and that tracking doesn't really account for late bloomers, because some people oh, absolutely you know, sometimes not. later in life they decide, hey, I'm going to start applying myself and doing what's necessary. Absolutely. But if they're already tracked to you know go in one direction, then it doesn't really give them an opportunity to. Right, and 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 as you can tell, I'm older, so my generation was absolutely tracked, in that the way you looked and where you came from very often determined what classes you were going to be placed in sure. without your input. Sure. And so very often we were we were told this is where you belong. You 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 will not be able to be successful wow. at this level of school. You need to go to a vocational school. Isn't and the vocational so schools back then were a lot different than they are now. How so? Well vocational classes, vocational schools were tracked also. You were tracked into a certain type of factory, certain type of, oh. this, is, this is for you kind of people. Yeah. Nowadays, because of the requirements that vocational schools take, and I mean, have you tried working on your car lately? No. Uh, yeah. I can't do it. I can't <laughs> do it. Even when they were much simpler, I couldn't work on my car. <laughs> right. I can't do it. So people who are mechanics, people who are plumbers, people, they have to have a certain amount of intelligence. They have to be able to do things so that I have a doctorate from UCLA, mm -hmm. but I cannot work that. I can't do Absolutely. plumbing. Absolutely, certain can, things, right. It takes a special kind of person to do that. And so wow. the vocational aspect of education nowadays looks so different and we need to change that mindset I think we do. I think we do. Your conversation about traffic reminds me of a conversation I had with one of my colleagues when I was in college. And for some reason, we had engaged in this conversation about tracking and about teachers' um, expectations of us and, right. and that kind of thing. And this is an African-American uh, student. And he was saying that, you know, he knew that he wanted to be an attorney. And he had always been groomed to become an attorney. But when he was in ninth or tenth grade, he said somebody had come to class and, and told him, you know what? 
we have to be really realistic. And you've heard this right. a million times, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and maybe you need to consider um, a career in refrigeration right. or something. Right. That, you know, but they were attempting to track right. him. And, and so, yeah, so that's really real. So the question, though, I'm trying to pose is that uh, many K-12 through educators feel that they feel that the best way to continue to educate students is to have a colorblind approach because they view colorblind as being fair because it involves creating like a uniform set of rules that apply evenly to everybody. And on the surface, it sounds like, yeah, it sounds very fair to everybody. But my contention is that when you look at the results, as everybody does, you look at the results at the end of the day for the statewide assessments, and they're broken out by class and color and, 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 and you know, race and socioeconomics, then uh, you have to do something different if every year and every decade a significant portion of students are being left behind. And so I just think we need to do something different. Right. And, and if you, you compare the aspect of colorblindness with having your own children, mm -hmm. your own children, let's say you have twins. Mm -hmm. Well, you're do you twi have twins? We have twins. Oh, yes. wow, they're know. they're older. They're adult okay. male, but they're yes, we have twins. Well, your twins may look alike. Mm -hmm. We're born minutes apart, mm -hmm. but they have different needs. Very often, they have different personalities. So, if you try giving, if you try being equal, mm -hmm. then you're giving both of them the very same thing, whether or not they need the same thing. Right. If you are being equitable, which is different than equality, right. equity is different than equality. Sure. So that if you are being equitable, you are giving each of them what they Indeed. need. And very often in our society and in our schools and, and in businesses, communities, mm -hmm. we often believe or attempt to equate equality with doing the right thing. Well, equality at certain points, absolutely. Right. Sure. But when people have different needs, you don't give them the same thing. That's true. Now, the aspect of colorblindness, uh, you, you used a, a great term in that people I want to hear that, this. What is it? No, people say <laughs> that, that's, that it really is a good thing. But what colorblindness does is that it takes away from who our children are. Absolutely. It takes away from their characteristics. We cannot, we cannot forget by looking at you that you're an African-American male. Absolutely. Or that I'm a Latino male. That's the way it is. That's how it okay? is. Okay, so don't be colorblind. Be color brave. You, nice. you take a look at that TED that Talk. Too? No, no, no. That one I stole. Okay. That's from, a, that's from a TED Talk. We must acknowledge what we look like because that's who we are. That's what we bring to the table. Uh, I was an elementary principal years ago, and one of the best things that I, that I really think I did was that I was able to acknowledge and and develop parent participation by by recognizing and valuing what what each of the races and cultures brought to the table oh nice it wasn't that's what's needed it, absolutely it wasn't that i was so great of an academic mm -hmm. what it was that i went back to school when i was 38 to start my second year of college so okay. i had I had experienced life to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I'd been to the principal's office with my kids. <laughs> and so I knew that what was very, very important was that we had to treat people with respect. We had to acknowledge what they looked like, where they came from. And sure. this was not just people of color. This was also the, the white folks that came in. Sure. We have to acknowledge them. Where Absolutely. do they come from? I mean, really, I, my wife and I were in Ireland this past summer, and if you take a look at the Irish people and the Latino people, there's a lot of similarities there, you sure, know? But, and, and so, but we have to do it for everyone. That's true. I, yeah. I totally agree with it. And so that actually is a perfect segue into the next <clears throat> part of what the discussion um, that I'd like to have, and that is um, the accountability factor and as far as it relates to teacher education programs. Mm -hmm. Because I, we have a lot of teachers who exit teacher education programs and, and they have solid pedagogy, yet they have difficulty being able to have the curriculum 
relate to the students or, or having the students connect. You know, there's connections are really important if you're trying to motivate students and engage them and, and, and train them and gather them. So I just think that uh, teacher education programs, there's something to be done and something to be said if they could embed um, a multicultural education component within it that yeah, can, uh, can address I, that. I, I recall when I first went back to school and I was actually at a university down south working on my teaching credential. Mm -hmm. And what is um, down south? It, it, well, I'm from Satakoy, little community, Latino community, just outside Ventura. Oxnard oh, okay. Area. So you mean Southern California? Right, Southern California. Oh, I'm from yeah. Florida, so you say down south. I'm like, what, Mississippi? No, no, no. So, well, down south is Southern California gotcha. here. But uh, what was I talking about? Let's see. What were we talking about? Uh, Culturally, culturally, multicultural, multicultural education, education oh, yeah. and teacher Thank education. I once took a class that was taught by a uh, by an instructor who every t and it was a multicultural required multicultural class okay and every time he made a statement he looked over at me and said isn't that correct ken <laughs> and it was a great aha moment for me wow. just because i recognized at that point this was a hoop I wasn't yeah. going to learn anything in yeah. this class. Sounds like he was relying on you to kind of validate. He was right, relying on me to validate yeah. the things that he was saying about people of color. Sure. And so it, it was a great lesson in the sense that you're absolutely right about teacher education. I think that there are some wonderful people in teacher education, mm -hmm. and I spent 13 years, 14 years in higher education. Mm -hmm. the, the point is that if you're going to have classes taught on multicultural education, they need to be taught by people who know multicultural education. Absolutely. Not people who are placed at that particular class. Absolutely. You know, because that's Through what's no fault left. of their own. Through no fault of their own. Sure. And, <clears throat> and I, I remind people that uh, in California, for instance, over 80% of our students are kids of color. Absolutely. And about I was just going to make that point. And about 80% of our teachers are white females. Oh, white. Absolutely. And so often when I go to speak to teacher groups, they're waiting for me to, you know, come down on them. Mm -hmm. And I remind them that there is no line of people of color waiting to become teachers right now. I know. And we, we can talk yeah. about that later. Absolutely. But what I say to them is that if you can't help our kids, who will? That is a good point. And so true. we have to work together. And it's not that they don't want to help. They don't know what they don't they know. They don't have the skills, right? They don't have the skills. They don't know what they don't know. And, and as I've, I've indicated, I've been from elementary to doctoral programs, middle school, high school. And good people, good people but they get very frustrated because they don't understand each other. Absolutely. They don't understand the kids. Why do these kids not want to learn? Well, it's not that they don't want to learn. They learn differently. They learn differently. I'll tell you a true story. When I decided to become a teacher, and it was a second career for me too. My first career was in corporate America. But when I first decided to become a teacher, I wasn't sure which grade level I wanted to teach. So I did two years of substitute teaching and I was working in two different districts. I was working in Pasadena uh, Unified School District as well as Los Virgenes Unified School oh, District, yeah. which was- Agora uh, area. Yes, yes. Calabasas. Yeah. Calabasas. And so, I mean, if you don't know Southern California, if you don't know Calabasas, you know it's a really wealthy, right. pretty much white uh, school area. And so, you know, <laughs> I want to tell you this story. I, uh, one of the first days that I was a substitute in a second grade class, I uh, checked into the office, I went and got the key, and I went to this classroom, and again, it was easy to see that there weren't any African-American students anywhere on the campus. But I went to the classroom, one of the first things that I saw was this huge poster, and on the poster was a hand-drawn illustration of an African-American student. And there was a caption underneath his name that says, my name is, Ty hello, my name is Tyrone. I don't have a father. I'm new to this school. I did not eat dinner last night and I'm tired. <clears throat> Can we be friends? And when I, when I was in that classroom, I spent, I don't know, two or three minutes just kind of staring at that. 
And I knew and understood what that teacher was trying to yeah. do. She was trying to, you know, build a classroom environment where students have empathy for others and, you know, are kind of cognizant that we live in a pluralistic society, et cetera. But at the same time, I was even then as a substitute teacher, I was thinking, wow, she's probably reinforcing a lot of stereotypes. Yeah. So if an African-American student had gone into that classroom, um, the assumption would have been, that, oh, he, he didn't have a daddy <laughs> and he hungry and he broke, you know, that whole thing. And so no sooner than I was just kind of looking around for the classroom, the teacher walked into the classroom, she came, she showed up, and she nervously introduced herself to me, and she immediately just kind of took a stance in front of the poster. And she was just kind of shifting in front of the poster, saying, hey, we're gonna have, you have a, a music station over here, and you've got a mass station over there, but she would never move from in front of the poster. And finally I had to say, can you show me like where some of this stuff is? And I've already seen the poster, and it, it was at that moment that she got her relaxed, <laughs> and she started showing me stuff. But again, you know, pedagogy, the teacher education program, you know, could give her a lot of information about how to do things right, right. when it comes to multicultural There's, education. There's, um, over the years, I've, I've presented numerous workshops on the aspect of deficit thinking. Mm. Um, yes. Deficit thinking as opposed to asset building. Can you explain to our viewers what deficit-based thinking deficit is? Deficit thinking is when you, uh, you blame the student or you blame the family or the, you blame the community. In other words, you know, if their parents only, if their parents yes. cared more, if their parents, mm -hmm. uh, if, if the students spoke English better, if, yes. you know, if the, if the students um, came from more money, if they had yeah. more money, if, 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 that if, they, if it's, it's the that parent, neighborhood, right, it's the neighborhood, it's the, the aspect of deficit thinking really stimulates these stereotypes mm -hmm. that we have. And so often deficit thinking occurs because we don't know each other absolutely if we knew each other the aspect of deficit thinking would change because i i'm not saying and i, I have totally never agree. said that all latinos all african americans right. all Hmong, all all people of color are this ap students sure. right what I'm saying, is, what I've always said is, all of us have the right to earn an education. All of us have the right and have earned the right, mm -hmm. most of the time, to be treated with respect. All of us, including the dominant group, has sure. the opportunity and should be given the opportunity to mm -hmm. prove who they are and what they are. I love that. And very often, the stereotypes immediately place kids of color in a negative lens. Sure. Very often. And it's not, again, it's not that they're bad people. It's just that they don't know. Absolutely. It's, it's that you don't know. But you know. would think, Dr. Magdaleno, if you've got all of this concrete research, you've got data that goes back decades to show, hey, we have a problem here. And so I've been thinking lately, like, there probably is some accountability that needs to take place at the state level, if not at the national level, because, like, the achievement gap is pervasive across the country. Right, and the, the, the achievement gap is, I haven't taken a look at the data lately, mm -hmm. but my inclination and from what I'm hearing from people it that changed. are part of the system, it's not closing. Right. Everyone is improving because they're getting better at the test, mm -hmm. but the achievement gap itself is not closing. Um, I think that it's a, well, I don't think, I know it's a systemic issue. Absolutely. It's, it's absolutely a systemic issue because if you take a look at, at, the, at the, the way that education, the system itself was developed. Yes. It was yes. not, it's not for the, it's not for it's us. Not, it's not designed for students of color. It's not for, it's not designed for students of color and it was not designed for poor whites either. Right. Okay. But, Lower socioeconomic. But, right. But essentially, the same system has remained in place over the years. And I, I'm a public school person. I believe in public school. So am I. But it's, product it's it. more and more difficult sometimes yeah. to not say. And, and I've said this over the years. For instance, and this is going to get somebody up, upset out there. Oh, good. But, That's good. Ruffle the but, feathers. Well, what I, people will say, well, we should not have same-gender classrooms. 
Uh, Title do we, nine. Do we I understand? Okay, okay, yeah. I, no, no, I understand. We should not have same race schools. My response to that is with a question. And the question is, is it working? If it's working. If it's working, use it. Because when you take a look at the school to prison pipeline, you take a school at the, uh, the, the issues of early literacy and how many of our kids cannot read. Yes. If it's working, do it. Right. It, wouldn't it be better to do that, to use it, than to have our kids end up in the system, in the prison system? You take a look at the dropout Absolutely. figures, and you take a look at the prison system. And how much it costs. And, to, oh, yeah, yeah, it costs a lot more yeah. to keep someone in prison sure. than it does to school them. Right, right. But it's, it's, we, we continue... What's the uh, the definition of insanity? Oh, to continue to do the same thing, expect something, a yes, different result or something like that. doing the same like thing that. over and over and expecting different results. Absolutely. Why are we doing this? It's not working. Absolutely. So let's, we're smart people. And the people who most need for us to advocate for them don't have advocates. Well, they right. have you and me and a few. Right. Right. But they don't have enough advocates, and things right. aren't, aren't changing. My, uh, my nonprofit that I hope we can talk about in a little bit, my nonprofit is part of what's called the Fixed School Discipline Coalition. Okay. It's, it's, uh, we've been part of that for probably since about 2012, 2012, 2013. And uh, about three years ago, I was one of a group of members from the Fixed School Discipline Coalition that went before went up to Sacramento and we went before the board to to determine the um, I can't old old person that's here. okay but you went to Sacramento um, we went make to Sacramento some and we were able to the suspension include, rate maybe we were talking about suspension rates and mm -hmm. such we were able to include race culture self-esteem equity in the changing of the standards mm -hmm. for how for for um, for behavior for sure, control. and oh, and they, but um, but here's the issue: you, you can change the rules, but if there's no one to make sure the rules are met, oh, yes, and met with, then it's meaningless. So you need to have an oversight committee yeah, to monitor. Yeah, absolutely. So as part of this, we've said, okay, you know, we'll fix school discipline. We're going to change the change the manner in which kids of color, and it's mostly males of color. Absolutely, let me just tell you. Yeah, it's Absolutely. mostly males of color. Let and so, yeah, oh, I'm just saying that we need to have some way of enforcing those standards, and it really is up to each district to be able to do that. Absolutely, and it is work, and I think that's why, why people shy away from it, because it does mean that you have to do a little bit more work than you might oh, be absolutely. accustomed to in your, your school district. But on that same note, I want to just kind of share two different anecdotes um, from my own experiences. When I was in the 12th grade, you know, first of all, I was raised by two different sets of uh, grandparents in the South, and you know, we weren't rich, we were pretty much poor. But I was always really outspoken, and nobody monitored my grades, and so I didn't really apply myself. But I was always borderline rude, right? And so when I was in 12th grade, though, I took a home economics class that was taught by um, a really pretty little white woman. Um, and she came to the class this one day with a salad. And the salad contained a lot of things that I wasn't accustomed to seeing in the salad, just because of my own frame right. of reference, right? Um, there were olives in it, I remember, and bell peppers and things like that. And she said, you guys have to make us this before the bell rings. Well, to make a long story short, before I knew anything, I had said, oh, this salad is for white people. And that teacher sent me out of the classroom. And not only did she send me out of the classroom, she sent me to the office. The office sent me to an alternative school for five days. And so in retrospect, I'm looking at that as a situation that probably could have been remedied by pulling me outside the classroom or giving me detention. But as it were, I spent five days at a different school, missing five days of home ec, science, <clears throat> math. And we all know when you miss even one day of any mm -hmm. of those disciplines, what that does to your, your education. Yeah, there was, a, I believe it was about four years ago, I wrote a short article for uh, 
leadership magazine for the AXA, Association of California School Administrators. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with uh, cultural value. Okay. And again, it goes back to our kids don't arrive at school with a blank slate. They bring value with them. They, Absolutely. They, you know, we, we are storytellers. Very often, people of color, especially, we're storytellers because Absolutely. our stories aren't told in the textbooks. We have so many And, and I, have, I have said over the years and have spoken to publishers and asked another question. Where am I? Where go. am I in the books? Right. And am I supposed to really identify with pilgrims? <laughs> Imagine and, me no, too. No, it just it just that I never ima I never identified Absolutely. with pilgrims. And with so me. here I am, I'm I'm retired now mm -hmm. and I ask the same question. So nothing strange. But, but what I ask is where are we? Absolutely. Where are we? And teachers should not have to bring in their own use their own money to bring in culturally relevant Right. materials so that kids see themselves in our schools. Absolutely. I totally agree Especially with Especially when we're 80% of the students in the state That's of California. That's a great point. That's an excellent point. Right. And so the, the aspect of being culturally relevant, it, it all goes around. It's the, it's the it? Japanese lesson study type of plan, do, check, act. If we would just do that for the different curriculum areas, where are we? Where are we? Are we really meeting the needs of all of the kids? You know, it's easy to say all kids can learn. Right. Well, all kids can learn, but all kids are going to learn differently. Yes. And it's, it behooves a teacher to help or oh, de develop the lesson in such a way that everybody can see themselves and make connections and therefore be a little bit more motivated right. and inspired. And by the way, the, that group in Sacramento where I went that I couldn't think of, it was the... <laughs> California Commission on Teacher Credentialing. Credentialing. Oh, mm -hmm. I pay them money. Yeah, you? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I did too over the years. Um, Dr. Magdaleno, I want to make sure that we talk about your nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you talk about the nonprofit, are you talking about the Center for? It's a center for, it's we. Leadership. It's, it's clear. Okay. And that's the way I remember it. That's what my license plate uh -huh. says. It's the Center for Leadership, Equity, and Research. Equity and Research. And it's it really is a byproduct of, you know, as I indicated, I, I, was, a, I was a late bloomer myself. And I uh, went back, actually, to get my doctorate at UCLA when I was 50. And I uh, ended up with a doctorate from UCLA. And my, my dissertation was the um, development of a mentoring program for Latina and Latino school administrators. Wow. It was called... Um, Is that the called, BMOC? Uh, uh, no, no. Okay. It, it, it was uh, actually meeting, meeting the needs of Latina and Latino administrators in the 21st century. That's basically what it was. So I developed a mentoring program for a group called CALSA. It's the California Absolutely. Association of They're Latino driving. Superintendents and Administrators. You developed well, that? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I, was, I was the developer of that. Right that on, was my dissertation. And then in 2011, because I went to higher ed, well, higher ed professors are a little bit more active, okay. activist okay. than P-12 administrators. So I broke away and started my own nonprofit, which is CLEAR. Right. CLEAR is really based on, uh, there's, there's three different parts of it, but leadership is really about the development of leaders of color. That's okay. what I've been doing for 20 years. And, it's, and we're, we are not exclusive. I mean, we, we absolutely ask allies to come in. We have sure. white administrators who are part of it, but the best part of that is they, they get to learn about us. Yes. So they get to learn about synergistic us. Synergistic relationship. Absolutely, and we develop strong networks. It's really important. Wow. My research years ago said that for administrators, it's a very isolated position anyway. Mm -hmm. Very lonesome. Tell very me about lonely. it. Yeah, oh, my God. Very lonely. Absolutely. But if you have a support system in place that helps you sustain, you know, we can get named positions, mm -hmm. but if we don't sustain the positions, then it really is... It served no purpose. You, you didn't no get a purpose. chance to, to execute anything. That's Absolutely. true. And that's been my experience, at least on one occasion, where right. I thought I was going to be a new administrator with all the support and mentorship, and it's like... Right. Didn't happen. Yeah, so CLEAR is very, uh, we, we actually, if you look at our roster of cohorts, <clears throat> 
it's African American, it's Latino, it's Hmong, and and it's white. Nice. Uh, generally in that, generally Four. Latino, African American, Hmong, <clears throat> and uh, and then we have the equity piece, which for the last few years has really been addressing school discipline through the Fixed School Discipline Coalition. If you look at our site, which is www.clearvoss, C-L-E-A-R-V, as in Victor, O-Z, dot com. I was curious com. about the Voss part. Yeah, vo voice, clear voice. Oh, gotcha. And so Clear Voss, if you look on there, there's a toolbox for uh, restorative justice, PBIS, social justice. social justice, it's all mm -hmm. on there. Uh, so that is that has been our equity strand, but mm -hmm. starting this year, we are actually going to begin, and we're forming it right now, is literacy as a social justice aspect. Nice. So we're going to be addressing early literacy all the way through. We're going to start with early literacy, but we have a lot of kids in high school can't read, middle school this can't read, community colleges can't read. So we want to be able to address it wherever the need is. <clears throat> and then the last piece, excuse me. It's okay. I'm talking too much here. No, it's okay. <clears throat> I did want to ask you about how you go about uh, soliciting members, uh, mentees. Um, word of mouth, really. We oh, don't, really? Yeah, it, it's interesting that we're in our seventh cohort now wow. for, the, for the leadership aspect. And we really don't have to recruit because we have a huge network. I mean, we have a uh, little over 2,000 people on our contact list. I have 2,200 people on LinkedIn, have 600 on wow. Twitter. And so it's a matter of people just networking. Just networking, because sure. networking's huge. It is. You know, if you've been an administrator, you know yeah. networking's huge, because if you're looking for another job, you yes. have to reach out to other people. I've got to remember that. That's yeah, sure. you know, and, and so that is, uh, that's a big part of it. We, the research piece, we have a, uh, a peer publication, peer-reviewed publication called right. the Clear Boss Journal. Right. Uh, edition just, just came out. Uh, we've done research on men and boys of color. Uh, I remember that when I took a look at right. that um, right. a couple of years ago. So we are, uh, we just brought on a marketing person because remember this is the first time, I retired in August, mm -hmm. so it's the first time that I've not been working at the university that I'm getting to spend time yes. just with my nonprofit. So now you can And I'm so it. passionate about it, right. as you can tell. That's your baby. Um, it's my baby, absolutely. And so on March 1st, okay. we have a, uh, it's a it's Clear Leadership Mentoring Summit. Oh, it's in our, Clovis? It's in Clovis. It's at the Clovis Veterans Memorial District. Yes. It's our first one off campus at Fresno State. Um, Everyone thought that Clear was part of the university because I was there. Yes. But it's not. It's never been. It's it's a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And so on March first, and then one of my old football players from Ventura High School is actually our keynote speaker. Is that uh, the, Ramsey J. Junior. Ramsey? Oh, he's uh, a football player. Oh, he was in high school. I, <laughs> we, we can talk about that. I know he's that. he's like a public figure. He, oh, he's oh, Ramsey nationwide. J. Ramsey J. Was uh, he went to Fresno State. I didn't know that. And he comes up and speaks. Oh, yeah, Ramsey J. was one of my students, one of my football players. Don't believe any of the stories wow. he tells you about me. I was a nice guy. <laughs> okay, well, of course, of course, I knew that. I know you're nice. But Ramsey J., he speaks at, like, at D.C. and oh, all yeah. over Oh, he yeah, he, he has spoken uh, in front of uh, the Obamas, President yeah. Michelle Obama, absolutely. Wow. And he's, he, if you look on site, and read his bio. I we actually had to cut his bio down because he's done so much. And this guy's and he's relatively just really young nice too, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Like, Ramsey's probably is he thirty? Late thirties, I think. Oh, he is there. Okay, yeah. late thirties. So talk to us about the summit. So what's going to happen at the summit? Well, at the what summit, we, we always have we always have keynote speaker. We generally will bring people in, and it it is. It has evolved over time because when we first began the summits, it was really just about mentoring, and it was almost specifically educators. Okay. But in the seven years that we've been doing it, it has it has mentoring is still a part of it, but mm -hmm. it really is mostly about leadership development. Leadership of it, and of but leadership development. Okay. 
for people who who work in the social justice arena, people who are activists, people who uh, and we've had we've had number of different presentations by folks that are doing. Uh, uh, PBIS that are doing restorative sure. justice. Restorative uh, justice. This year, I invited uh, actually a group. I saw my my research was cited in their article and well, clear course. so I invited them to to present at the uh, summit this year on uh, the experiences of Latinas in school administration uh, because that was. That, Part of my initial research so there there are different workshops the most important part of it honestly is the opportunity for people to network with other yes. folks. it's it's nice every once in a while to be able to speak to the choir sure because you know we spend a Doesn't lot of time happen. talking to people who are not part of the choir right so, so to get together yeah, and get together i don't exchange we, best we, practices exchange best practices um we don't this is a personal thing i don't uh, have a keynote speak during lunch it's an opportunity for you to meet oh, good. And, yeah. and speak to other people and uh, i've always said you know people are paying to to, to be there Mm -hmm. to learn from each other and right. that's what we're going to be doing so you heard that march 1st march 1st at the clovis, clovis Veteran veterans memorial, memorial district building yes. i passed by that building today and yeah. i thought about it yes yeah absolutely yeah and uh you know we'll we always feed people well and well i'm sure it's not free but so talk about is there is there like a well, the, the the registration is one hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. However, if you register prior to January sixteenth, I believe, and it's on the website, mm -hmm. there's I believe it's one hundred and twenty five. Quite often, people will bring whole groups from school districts, and nice. uh, then that gets to me. Then, <laughs> then sure. we can negotiate. Yeah. You I know, mean, as to uh, it makes as, magic right, happen. Right. Right. All right. Super. I. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about one other thing, and that is so, uh, social no, school reform, no, restorative justice. That's what it is. Restorative justice. Is there a local guru, or are you the local guru? Because I've, I've gone to a couple schools, Dr. Magdaleno, where restorative justice is not implemented with fidelity. Like, they, you know, good intentions are in place, but... Just not implemented with fidelity. Yeah. No, I'm I'm not a guru at anything. I don't think. I think I'm 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 a, I'm <laughs> like one of those folks. You know, the kind of a handyman. A, mm -hmm. I, I know a bunch of jack stuff. of all trades. Jack of all yeah. trades, master of none. But I, um, no, you know, I we ha I do have access mm -hmm. to the experts, to the gurus on restorative justice because they've written for our journal. Well, let me tell you, with that. I've actually read a lot of stuff on restorative justice, and I've worked with people who've read a lot of theory and read books on restorative justice. But it's one thing to read the theory, but when you when it's time to implement it and put it into practice, it doesn't always like fly smooth. Yeah, and I I, I want to preface this by saying that I'm not a restorative justice I, expert. Gotcha. I have just read and probably same thing you've done. Right. And and. Remember, I was a middle school teacher, sure. assistant principal, principal elementary Wore principal, high hats. school counselor, yeah, I know teacher, and university professor. My question, again, I drive people because I, crazy because I ask a lot of questions. It's the Socratic thinking sure. that I do. And that is, why do we need... Uh, this is going to be heavy. Yeah, yeah. Why do we need to have all of these intervention programs mm -hmm. shouldn't we front load it and take care of the problems before we have to bring kids in to restore yes absolutely and, and it, it's the same i mean i asked myself the same question yep. as a teacher as an administrator what am i doing or not doing where I have to continue to try to intervene, right, right, and take this There's something missing. child. Something's missing Absolutely. somewhere, and so that's why I, I am convinced 
that our my nonprofit's work, upcoming work in the area of cultural value mm -hmm. and early literacy is absolutely essential because I if agree. kids can read, they will succeed. I think you're right. And they've done a lot of research on oh, that. Absolutely. Students who misbehave usually are those who aren't really absolutely. grasping and what's or, being taught. Or if they're, you know, because there's such, you, you take a look at the number of words, the number of word difference between a, a, a person, a young student that starts school mm -hmm. having had preschool, having had access. See, access is huge. Sure. It's part of the equity act. Sure. If having had access to books, having had, had access to, to folks that can read to them, if you have that, the opportunities for you are limitless. I agree. If you start and you're already 80,000 words behind, for instance, yeah. it's going to be difficult. Right. And so I've always said, okay, let's let's work at early literacy. It's not my thing. I was an elementary principal, but, but I you recognize but it. I that recognized is it. Is where it needs to happen. And and politically I've always heard folks say, Well, why should people of color? Why should why should these folks get this? And I've said, Well it look It goes back to equity. Well, it goes back to equity. And sure. I've never asked for anything beyond an equal starting point. Sure. You give me an equal starting point. Hey, it's game on. Game on. Right. But if I have to start a quarter mile behind you, right. it's just with nothing. my short legs, man, I'm never catching up. Yeah. <laughs> you know? My short legs. Yeah. And, and that's just <laughs> it. I'm never catching up. Right. So if you never catch up. So if we can serve our young kids mm -hmm. and help them read that's right. really well by the time. They're either starting school or, or really the, the literacy and, and do it include cultural value so mm -hmm. that kids see themselves. Sure. So that kids uh, can say, I'm okay. Absolutely. I may not have all the money in the world, right. but I'm okay. Right. I can see how I connect <clears throat> to this whole thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's and, and so we do, after 30 something years as an educator, I. I very often I, I it drives me crazy <laughs> because I feel like we have the pyramid upside down. Explain what you mean by that. Well, Dr. by that I mean that we you know where you spend your money mm -hmm. is very often where your priorities are. Okay. And at the elementary level I don't believe and maybe I'm wrong but I don't believe that we spend the kind of money that we need to in order to make sure that all our kids have a good start. I was uh, so happy to hear that that the new gover governor, the incoming governor. Mm -hmm. Gavin Newsom. Yeah, that he's, you know, he's a first five guy. Yes, he is. And and I'm not part of first five, so but I, I believe in that. If we do that, then we don't have to spend all our money on interventions and doing that everything else so in middle school and high true. school. That is so true. I remember one year I read something along the lines, and I may not be able to quote it verbatim, but it speaks to the achievement gap and, and you know how students of color are left behind. But it went something like this, and that is uh, elementary teachers. How did it go? I think I'm going to mess it up. But students at the elementary level um, are nurtured and they are cared for, et cetera, and they seem to do okay. But by the time students get to high school, you have the dropout rate, you have students failing out and uh, just not turned on to school. And it's because at the elementary level, the teachers actually, you know, they care about the whole child. You know, if somebody's sick or asleep or whatever, they are, teachers are into it and they're trying to do what's necessary. But secondary teachers, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, you know, they teach a certain discipline. They teach content. I teach English. I don't deal with students with headaches or students who are having emotional issues. You need to go off to that building or that building and see if you can get it worked out. But there's something to be said about that nurturing factor and students feeling like you genuinely care about them. Oh, I, I have so much respect for elementary school oh, so teachers. I, I can never do it. I, I, it's, it's funny because... I used to tell elementary, elementary school teachers work so hard mm -hmm. to get their classrooms ready. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's beautiful. You Boy, walk man, in there and it's just colorful. Yeah, and, all. and I used to have a friend at high school. All he did was change the year on the back. <laughs> you know, it would go from 1988 to eight, 1989. He's not you know, worried about just, That was it. There's an, yeah. You'd have the same bulletins all sure. the way. And, the, the, you know, uh, when I was an elementary school principal, I was actually known as the Chicano Mr. Rogers. Oh wow! Yeah, because it has to be a it was right? it was my own. I gave myself that name. Oh, because when I was in um, at, at an elementary school, my favorite grade was kindergarten. I kindergarten. started because my kindergarten was away from the rest of the school, and I could go there and hide. <laughs> really? I would, t oh, I would tell good. my office manager, "Don't tell anyone where I am. If it's an emergency, call me." Good. But I, I went down once, and the teacher was giving, was rewarding kids, mm -hmm. and rewarding them with ice cream. However, not every kid got an ice cream. Oh, boy. it was one of those situations where Jeez. if you did something, you got one, and the other kids were without. Oh boy! And I didn't realize that, so she asked if I would help, and so I believe in I'm, praise and reward, but to not yeah, give so, a so I so. I said to her after this first time, don't ever do that to me again. Yeah. I said, I will come down every Friday. Right. I'll buy the ice creams. I'll bring the ice creams. But every child, if we're going to give one, we're going to give everyone. Nice. That's and right. here was the thing. Every Friday, I would go down. I would sit in one of those little chairs that I fit in, mm -hmm. you know, in kindergarten chairs. Tiny chairs. Yeah. And... The students came up, and all they had to do was tell me something good about themselves. Ah, nice. And what was really moving is sometimes they had difficulty. Ah. So I would have to help them, help them. Yeah. say help something them good about something. them. And I have a master's in guidance and counseling, so, you know, I, that, so you I may not look like it, but I do have that touchy-feely part sure, of me. I'm sure you do. Yeah. But that seeing kids at that level mm -hmm. when all they want to do is learn. I love it. That's all they want to do. They That's want to. It. They want to be loved, and they want to learn. And so we need teachers like you, or administrators like you, who have a heart for kids and doing what's right for kids, uh, in this industry called education. You guys, this is Dr. Kenneth Magdaleno, who is the director and CEO of Clear, which is a center for leadership, equity, and research. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's edition of the J-A-E-Z show. Until next time, we're going to sign off. Thank you so much Thank for being you. here today. Thank you. Appreciate it. I appreciate it.